John Glias, welcome. Good to talk to you. The DEI, what's interesting to me is traditionally you'd expect an organisation like yours to be involved in the scientific or the academic world, but here we are in a commercial environment and that's where a lot of your energy is directed. Yes, the Durham Energy Institute is unusual, maybe unique, in that we work very closely with both industry and with society. The way in which we integrate with industry is is very special indeed. One example, we work very closely with a company which was called Dong until very recently. Uh, it was an oil and gas company historically. Now it's entirely offshore wind. Uh, it's called Ørsted rather than Dong. And the way in which we work with them is uh, extremely integrated. One of the team, for example, has taken all of the data from offshore Denmark, all the wind farms, and helped Ørsted optimize harvesting of the energy. Um, is the international and indeed the, the national public debate as clear, as well informed as it might be? No, I think the, the appreciation of energy, whether it's by the general public or government, is very uh, broken up. Uh, for example, we just assume we can switch on the light and, and light will flood into the room. The link between that and what it takes to create the light is, is very poorly understood. So what it seems to me that you're saying is that policy is crucial to all this and the people that make policy aren't necessarily seeking the opinions of the right people. Uh, policy clearly drives the way in which every nation, every person uh, perceives and uses energy and yet I often think it's, it's very poorly informed. So we think of alternative energy, the members of the public, as wind, tidal and solar. Is it as simple as that? Wind, tidal and solar, or particularly wind in the UK, has made a massive inroads. We've dramatically decarbonised the grid, but it's only part of the story. If we think about northern, the Northern Hemisphere, the UK, Northern Europe, around about 50% of all the energy we use is used to heat space like this, and yet it's almost invisible. And nearly all of that, certainly within the UK, 70-odd percent comes from burning fossil fuels. So if government came to you and said, where should we be putting our energies as far as creating heat or keeping the lights on is concerned over the next medium term, 20 to 50 years, what would your list of priorities be? In the UK, because we are so dependent upon heat, half of our energy comes from, uh, or half of our requirement of energy is for heating space. It really is to tackle that piece. In terms of energy security at the moment, the UK's woefully dependent upon imported gas. So taking the UK as an example, what sort of natural resources should we be looking at to generate that kind of energy? The heat itself is valuable. And even a country like the UK, we could have in the order of minimum 100 years supply of heat just from the rocks beneath our feet. Whether it's sedimentary basins adjacent to Liverpool and Manchester or old flooded coal mines in County Durham. The second component that we could use is industrial heat. I'm now working with people in Teesside to see if we can move some of the heat from the industry there uh, into people's homes. So what's getting in the way of you getting that message out, of having that, these ideas actioned or even tested? My own perception as to where the holdups come in is around, we've not done it like this before, surely it's risky. No, it's not risky. The technology has been with us for 10, 20, even 30 years. Towns like uh, Heelan in eastern Netherlands already heat the whole of the city with coal mine heat. It's just that... And not burning coal. And not burning coal. Using the water which has now flooded into the old coal mines as a way of district heating. So if you had the platform, what would your message be? Message is very simple, really. Don't, don't forget heat. Heat is critical to the way in which uh, our industry, our homes work. Uh, and it's also the leftover bit. Whenever we make an energy conversion, think of switching on your laptop. The battery gets warm. Uh, the bicycle brakes get warm as you, as you slow down. Every time you do an energy conversion, you produce heat. At the moment, that heat is dissipated. We could use that along with heat that sits naturally within the earth. It's low carbon, it's sustainable, and it will outlast humanity. John Glias, thanks very much indeed. Good to talk to you.